Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar um, showing a first technical demonstration of the Cancer Image Europe platform, um, which is being uh, built and deployed by the UCAM project. Um, just as a note, uh, this webinar is being recorded, so please take note of that. Uh, the recording will be made available in the next days on the Cancer Image EU website, um, where you can um, rewatch it or share it with people who wouldn't, uh, who, who weren't able to attend. Um, for our agenda, uh, we have a couple of points. So first of all, this is the introduction by by myself, uh, Peter Rodebeek. I'm a project manager at IBIR, the European Institute for Biomedical Imaging Research, and I'm also the project coordinator for the UCAM project. Um, then we have uh, our next point, um, sort of a brief introduction on the European Cancer Imaging Initiative and um, how UCAM fits in, um, which is being presented by our project um, officer from the European Commission, Alexander Rezilovska, and Luis Mati Bonmati, the scientific coordinator of the project. Um, maybe the two of you can just briefly say hi and, and quickly introduce yourself. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Alexandra Vesolovska. I work in DG Connect of the European Commission and I'm the um, project officer of the UKIM project and also I'm, I'm, I'm in the unit leading on the European Cancer Imaging Initiative. Uh, also you. welcome from my part. I'm uh, Luis Marti Bonmati and I'm um, chairing the medical imaging department here in Valencia, La Fe University and Technical uh, Hospital. And, and acting also as scientific coordinator of uh, the infrastructure in Ukraine. Yes, thank you very much. Um, following that, we have a brief overview of the UKIM project, uh, which is being presented by uh, Karina Soler, uh, also from Hulafe. Maybe you can also briefly introduce yourself. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Karina Soler, and I am biomedical engineering and I am working in the University and Polytechnical Hospital La Fe in Valencia in the Biomedical uh, Imaging Research Group and in the IT area of this group. All right, thank you very much. Uh, following that, we get to the, uh, the let's say, the, the main part of today's webinar, uh, which will be the live demonstration of the platform uh, and the way it is currently available. Uh, this will be done by Ignacio Blanquer and Esther Bron. Maybe the two of you can also briefly introduce yourself. Okay, thank you, Peter. Thank you very much all the attendees. I'm Ignacio Blanquer. I'm a professor at Technical University of Valencia, and I am co-chairing the central hub of the UCAM infrastructure. Hi, good morning. My name is Esther Bron. I am assistant professor at Erasmus MC, Rotterdam, the Netherlands, uh, where I lead the research line on neuroimage analysis and machine learning. And I also work at uh, HealthRI, the national infrastructure of the Netherlands for making healthcare data available. And in this project, I am a co-lead of together with Ignacio of the technical work package. All right, wonderful. Um... After that, of course, we, we we want to engage with our audience as well. So we'll have some uh, some some brief feedback uh, with the audience. We have, um, I think, a couple of questions using uh, Slido prepared, uh, where we can quickly do some um, overview of how familiar people are with anything or how you'd like to use it. And then, of course, we have some time for question and answers as well um, before we will close. Um, today's session. Uh, during the closing, I will also briefly mention something about the upcoming open call as well. Um, so for the questions, you, you're, of course, uh, available to uh, or able to ask questions uh, at any time. Um, to make it easiest for us, please use the Q&A functionality in the Zoom webinar. Uh, we do also have the webinar chat, um, but sometimes questions there could be overlooked or missed. Um, so the Q&A functionality is a bit easier for us to keep track. Um, we will do our best to answer all those questions, uh, either during the different presentations or during the Q&A session, or perhaps uh, in the actual Q&A se uh, section itself. And I think with that, I will sh stop sharing my screen and we can um, move to our first uh, speaker in this, in this sense, uh, which would be uh, Alexandra. Um, and I think Ignacio will share the screen. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Yes, just let me go into presenting mode and confirm me that, oops, sorry. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, perfect. 
Yes, okay. okay so. Thank you very much, um, uh, Peter, for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me um, uh, to this, this webinar. Um, and before, uh, um, as I said, my name is Alexandra Vesolovska. I work uh, in the European Commission in the unit which is leading on the European Cancer Imaging uh, Initiative. And so before we uh, deep dive into the Cancer Image Europe platform, I would like to say a few words about the, the overall context of this work and present the overall picture and how we see the project fit in the policy context and the landscape of the EU actions and priorities. If you could move to the next slide, please. So the European Cancer Imaging Initiative um, is the flagship uni um, initiative of the Europe Speeding Cancer Plan. And the overall goal of the initiative is to foster innovation and the deployment of digital technologies for improved clinical decision-making, diagnostics and treatment in cancer care. This initiative was launched to capitalize and bring forward the work that the European Commission has been supporting under the research program, and the, in particular, the work of a cluster of five uh, research projects on artificial intelligence and health imaging. And this, the work of these five projects sets the basis and is brought forward uh, in the European Cancer Imaging Initiative, which we launched in January 2023. With the initiative, we want to bring together different stakeholders, healthcare providers, research institutes and innovators and support them in developing and making the best use of data and data driven tools and technologies for cancer treatment and care. Next slide, please. And at the core of this initiative is the UK project, which is deploying the Cancer Image Europe platform. So this platform, and Luis will talk about more about it, and the UK consortium will talk more about that, is designed to be an experimentation platform for the development and benchmarking of AI tools towards precision medicine in cancer care. The infrastructure that the project is deploying will be a hybrid distributed and centralized infrastructure of cancer images and related clinical data. And it will federate data coming from distributed nodes, research repositories, European research infrastructures, hospitals, clinical centers, national repositories and initiatives on secondary use of data, but also for example, the screening programs. And it will make available um, large amounts uh, of high quality data to researchers, innovators and clinicians and support them in making the best use of this data for deriving data insights and developing innovative solutions in cancer care, solutions which will and should ultimately benefit cancer patients. So the project has been ongoing for slightly over a year. And the major milestone was last September with the first prototype, which was delivered. And today, the first live demonstration of this platform capabilities um, is another important step. And in particular, important to also engage with the community, with the target users of the platform, getting your feedback uh, on the platform and the direction the project is taking. Um, so this will be covered more detail in the later sessions. I just would like to say a few words on the policy context and other EU actions that contribute to the goals of, of the UK project and the goals of the initiative. So we should see it, um, the Cancer Imaging Initiative in the context of the European data strategy, which recognized that access to data and the ability to use it are essential for innovation and growth. And then a second important point to make is that the UK project is developing this infrastructure in an evolving regulatory landscape and of particular, particular relevance here is the European health data space regulation, which is in the final stages of negotiations. And that this platform that is being developed is supporting the goals of that regulation and is being developed um, in full alignment with the EHDS frame, framework. Also, another important uh, piece of legislation is the AI Act, uh, which the European Parliament approved yesterday in a plenary vote, uh, which introduces legally binding rules for AI systems that are placed on the market and, or put into service in the EU. Um, and the AI Act, um, and also this, it is important because this AI Act precisely highlights the importance of the UK project and the um, because it, it aims to foster a development um, and uptake of safe and trustworthy AI and 
we know that to develop trustworthy AI solutions in healthcare, access to large amounts of high quality and diverse data representative of the European population will be key. And this is what the, the European Cancer Imaging Initiative and the platform, uh, the Cancer Image Europe platform is about. And finally, um, the AI innovation package, which the Commission presented in, in January uh, this year, aims to foster an innovative European AI ecosystem for startup, startups and innovators in multiple sectors, including health. And this communication also highlights the importance of the cancer of data spaces such as Cancer Image Europe um, for the development of future generative AI models for healthcare. So this is the policy context in terms of actions that contribute to the goal of the initiative beyond the UK project. We, the European Commission is also funding uh, um, establishing European edge and cloud services and also high performance computing facilities, uh, which are necessary for um, computing intensive operations such as training of AI algorithms. Also, we are supporting testing and experimentation facilities for health, which will provide services to SMEs to test their uh, AI solutions in real life environments. And there, one of the addressed use cases is cancer. And finally, we also support digital innovation hubs, and many of them address the health sector. And there, the goal is to further help with the uptake of digital um, technologies in health. So we see that the Cancer Image Europe platform at the core of these of, of the European Cancer Imaging uh, Initiative, and we hope um, that it will fuel the ecosystem with access to large amounts of high quality, diverse data, but also tools and services to work with that data and making it possible for um, to research and develop innovative solutions for cancer care in an efficient way better than we can do today and in line with uh, European values and rules. So with this, I would like to pass the floor to Professor Bonmati, who will present the UK project and then the Cancer Image Europe platform. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Alexandra. I'm, um, I will follow on your um, pathway uh, on that uh, really important landscape on how well, Luis, you have to say to change the, the view we are seeing the presenting mode okay now now it's perfect okay. perfect thanks a lot well, I was just saying thanks uh, to Alexandra and also thanks for those uh, 220 uh, attendees we do have online to this first webinar of the uh, EUCAIM Project and I'm just willing to share with you why do we need uh, this infrastructure at the at the European level, and the main reason for that is to improve the transition from whatever we are doing on the research area, mainly working with uh, radiomics and imaging biomarkers, at in, into the hospital level. I mean, if we are really willing to change the pathway and the way we can introduce uh, knowledge uh, just to take the best decisions with patients with cancer is not only to be based on whatever we know from uh, clinical evidence that was there, but also to introduce these new tools into for the prediction of models. And to do that properly, we really trust on uh, AI, artificial intelligence, um, the seed of this infrastructure is uh, AI for health imaging, uh, but for AI models to be and AI tools to be constructed and trained and test and validate properly, well, of course, we need data. And that's why it's quite important to link uh, research repositories and data warehouses from the hospitals. We need the best tools, and that's why the uh, infrastructure is also providing with a catalog of tools and, and ways to train and develop new tools. And, and we also need communities. I mean, um, this infrastructure is really willing to perform networking and to allow researchers on a specific areas like immunotherapy or breast or lung or whatever other problem to work together. And we do recognize that um, to do that Properly, we have to go into the so many different problems 
we did have with uh, medical imaging, one of the most important was reproducibility of results. And that's why uh, among a huge amount of different issues like segmentation, annotation, uh, we are also working on data harmonization to decrease uncertainties. So the vision of, uh, of the infrastructure is to have a federated infrastructure to allow AI and medical imaging to help beating cancer. We are uh, envisioned to provide a research platform for developers, but also bench marketing AI tools. And we are working on this precision medicine. To do that properly, we have to improve the um, images that will be exposed to researchers and innovators. And that's why we are working on this Atlas of Cancer Images, which will be both central and distributed. And uh, even more, we recognize that data is generated every day at the hospitals. So we really have to link the uh, so many different hospitals at the European level on a federated way to uh, allow fast observational studies that will continue the populate of, uh, of this centralized image repository. So at the end, we want to help AI researchers to have the best tools. We really want to help clinical researchers to find the best models to make predictions and estimates in patients with cancer. And we also want to help innovators and companies on the process of uh, training, discovery, developing, but also testing and uh, validation and all the regulatory process uh, for the best uh, solutions. So the two main axes of EUCAIM will be related to uh, AA researchers on this um, storage of anonymized images, the distributed atlas of cancer images, where we will have uh, millions of images to train the AI models. And also we want to create a fast platform for observational studies on the real world, linking the so many different hospitals through their data warehouses on a, on a federated way. Uh, even more important is not only that we will uh, develop the infrastructure as we will see today, we are also working on the uh, sustainability of all the process after the construction of the infrastructure. It will stay there to continue helping researchers, clinicians, and, and innovators and companies. And to do that properly, we are deeply working on this um, uh, EDIC, uh, the European Digital um, Infrastructure Consortiums that will help us on the, on the process of the continued uh, improvement of uh, this um, precision medicine through, through medical imaging. And this is uh, my um, close to last slide willing to share with you the, the pipeline we do foresee uh, on this uh, AI, medical imaging, and prediction models is to, of course, work with data coming from the real world, from the hospitals, work on this secondary use of data. That's why we are deeply engaged on the European health data space for secondary use. We have to work with uh, pseudonymization, two steps, uh, common data models, uh, local research repositories, linking them to allow researchers um, to have an open access with the proper ethical, legal, and safety issues. And at the end, a uh, post-project exploitation, and then the results going back to the hospitals to help uh, patients which at the end is uh, the main goal. To do that, we are so happy we are able to construct this, let's say, ecosystem or environment or universe of both partners and stakeholders. We do have more than uh, 160 something stakeholders plus 76 uh, partners. And uh, as you will see, 
during today's presentation, the effort of all these partners and people, researchers, clinicians, and innovators are extremely important for the deployment of the infrastructure for the best of, uh, of research within radiology, medical imaging, and precision medicine. And uh, with this, I will finalize my presentation now. So back to maybe Peter or yes. Nat <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions uh, in the chat, and I think um, they're mostly being answered. So Ignacio already answered one. Uh, but maybe it's good to to just reiterate for everyone. Um, if you if you have a question, please use the Q and A functionality because then uh, we can answer them uh, during presentations, and and they're also available for everyone to read. Um, we will also put them uh, in our Q and A section on the website after uh, the webinar is over. Um, maybe in light of time, for now we can proceed with the uh, a bit more in depth overview of the UKM project from from Karina. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Karina Soler from ULAFE, and I'm going to present you a technical overview of the platform. As soon as you enter to the, uh, the UKIM dashboard, you will see the four main roles that will interact with the platform. Firstly, you can become a user if you want to explore the catalog and request access to data. This access request must be under a research project and will be evaluated by the access committee. In this uh, becoming a user section, you will find information about uh, this process and also the terms and obligations of use as well as a button to register that is equivalent to the one that appears uh, here in the main, um, in, in the top of the main page. Secondly, um, if you have developed tools, services, or applications, and you want to make them available in Elkai, you, you can participate as a, a software provider. In this section, uh, you will find the benefits of becoming such a provider and the software specifications and rules of, for participations that we have defined. On the other hand, if you are a, a person, group, entity, or any other type of organization in the health sector, and you have the right uh, to make uh, data available, you can join uh, UKIM. Uh, as a data holder. In this section, uh, we explain the different types of data holders, both in the research and in the clinical environment, and also the types of agreements that will be needed uh, to share the data if you are a federated node or to transfer them to the central storage. Finally, um, in the become a member um, section, we have uh, defined uh, the, the way to participate as a partner in, in being part of our consortium through the open calls and also to be a stakeholder and uh, seek collaboration. For example, you can submit an expression of interest and sign the, the corresponding collaboration agreement. In all cases, there will be the possibility to join or even to create a research community with common research goals that are, are for example, the same uh, type of cancer uh, studied or the same anatomical region of interest. And it will allow you not only to gain access to, to our environment, but also to initiate new projects with the uh, members of UKI. Okay, so uh, having seen the different roles that can interact in Elkain, we're going to explain the components of the platforms that are the ones that will be shown to you uh, later on in the live uh, demo. So uh, for the moment, we are focused on the i for health imaging projects that are the ones that you can see uh, here in the slide, but uh, we will take into account also the real world data from the clinical environment. 
So anonymous users will be able to access the dashboard and also to explore the public catalog where they can find uh, collections um, of the repositories that have been registered. And if they find interest in any of these collection or data sets, they can authenticate and request being part of the, in the UK in virtual organization that will give them uh, some capabilities. One of these capabilities is to query the data and obtain um, aggregated results. For example, if there is a, a lung cancer data set uh, for males and females aged from 30 to 80, but in your project are only interested in females uh, at a particular age, you may want to, to know the number of females that this uh, data state has. So with the Explorer service, you can query the data both in the FEDE, in the central storage or in the federated nodes that are prepared. Also, uh, authenticated users uh, will have access to a help desk that is a, a ticketing system to uh, receive uh, help in any of these uh, steps. So once you have selected a uh, data set or collection, if you want to request access to the data, you will go through the negotiator service where you will ask for the necessary documentation for the access committee to evaluate uh, your request. Um, after this evaluation and approval, you will initiate a negotiation with the data holders and then you will be able to view, access, or even download the data depending on the data holder's conditions. And also you will be able to perform a distributed processing or analysis. Last but not least, there will be a general monitoring system. However, the full integration of these components and the ideal workflow that we have defined depend on the level of compliance with the Data Federation framework. So in order to facilitate the onboarding of new providers uh, that maybe don't follow uh, our um, uh, Federation uh, framework, we have defined these three tiers of uh, data compliance. So tier one is addressed to repositories or data sources uh, which do not comply with the common data model defined in Eukain. Um, sorry, uh, defined in Eukain, but uh, uh, there is the possibility to search and explore the metadata catalog, but not to perform a federated query. To do so, we move to the tier two where a, where a medium level is complied, but to perform a model training or distributed processing a tier three with a fully compliance with the federation framework uh, is required. Um, there will be the possibility to, um, these tiers are scalable. So uh, um, both for research communities and data holders, um, can be support to upgrade from one tier to another. And uh, here you can see uh, more details about the functionalities associated to each component and what means being one tier or another in terms of uh, data compliance in the provider side and the user side. As you can see in all tiers and hyperontology associated to the metadata is uh, necessary and uh, you can uh, do uh, the, negotiator, the negotiator process and request access to the data set in any of the tiers. But to perform a federated search or a distributed processing, you would need a, a highest tier of compliance. And, that's all for my part. Thank you all. And we are going to see now the live demo. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I see that there's a lot of questions in the in the Q and A, and Ignacio is doing his best to answer as much as he can. I'll also, step in where I can. 
Um, so please keep uh, keep continuing to, to ask those questions. We'll we'll either try to address them uh, in the Q and A tool or during the Q and A session at the very end. Um, I think for now we're we're finally ready to do the actual demonstration. Uh, hopefully, this will answer a lot of your questions um, that you may have uh, up until now. Um, so please, Ignacio, uh, proceed with, okay. uh, with showing us how it works. Yes, one second that I start with the right. Oh, let me see if I can get rid of this. But okay, so let me explain. Thank you very much for the for participating in this webinar. So let me explain a bit how will be the uh, the rationale so first how can you access the our um our platform right so you can access our platform directly through the uh cancerima.eu web page going to the click on dashboard preview so i will start trying to uh, explain all the whole process that a researcher may go through in order to access the data right so but first let me explain that we have, um, I mean, in this dashboard page in which we will have the different connection, the connection to the different applications that we have in the platform, we also have additional information for the different profiles that the Karina has explained, like users, software provider, data holder, and members. So if you want to become a member, you can go there and you can fill in all the, the form in which you can put all the information related to your institution that you are getting in the loop of all the, our communication. You have also information related to the collaboration agreements and the different benefits of being a stakeholder that has been also been asked in the questions. The same if you are a data holder, as uh, it was explained, so we support, and I will take the opportunity to address this as we have in the several questions related to it. We have different profiles, so different types of data access. We are supporting federated node data that is stored in the provider side, and we support access through a federated distributed protection. This is the feature that will come up in June. Data that is uploaded on our reference storages, and then this can be processed in situ without downloading. And we also will support downloading of data if the license of the data is available. So we try to um, cover the different types of uh, providers. But let's go to the I will say the most interesting case would, will be how to request access to data, how to become a user. So then first there's an explanation of which is the what which data you can provide uh, with the different conditions, different types of information. We are linking our uh, catalog to other research infrastructure that are provided additional data. So then we have an explanation how is the access process. And then you realize that there is a public catalog that can be accessed anonymously, right? So um, I can go to the public catalog without any authentication and any authorization. So let's assume that I am a researcher that is looking for data related to colon cancer. And I, my study is focused on females on the uh, on an age range between 40 and 70 year old. And I need at least 100 cases for doing my research. So I can browse the catalog with the different um, uh, different collections and different data sets. I can filter and say, OK, I want those that are related to colon. And I realized that there's a couple of data sets from the collections of the 10 million colon cancer, one with one, 617 nine uh, subjects. So then I say, OK, this may be relevant for me. I click to see more information. I can see more information about this data set, all the different uh, types of data that has been the modalities. I see that there's CT scans. There are even, uh, I mean, of different types of, of, of body parts, has male and female and a range of uh, years. So I'd say, okay, this may be interesting. And I, I have a link to the image data. If I go to this, this is a provider, an external provider, and I realize that I need an account, right? So this data is not openly available, so I need to go through all the process. So for me, I see that this is an interesting case. So I will try to go to read the complete part in the dashboard, trying to understand what will be the procedure. Then if I continue reading, I realize that there is a way to log into the platform to create an account and then uh, request access. So I have two links here that are very relevant. One is this one that is the document that explains how the um, 
accounts are created. So we rely on the live say in AI, which is the uh, authentication authorization service that is being used by most research infrastructure in the biomedical field. So you have all the instructions there. Then you have another important document, which is the guideline of the different um, fields that you have to fill in in order to make a request. If you cl click here, you can find this struct of the different fields that describe an application for accessing data. Right, so let's go to the end, and then I see the become a user now. So I click on become a user, and then um, it goes to the life science array. Let's assume that I don't have an account. I will use the, um, I mean, I can use uh, any uh, ID provider, but in particular, it is recommendable that you use the one from your institution. So we have several catch all cases for the thing. My case this is my university. So I can click in and then I have to log in. So I will log in with another account just to show you how the process is, 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 is completed. So I will use this account. Hope to not to, to break it properly. And I will try to enter. So I get authorized. I create a can account in the life science, but still with an account of life science, I have to re request access to the bio group of UKM. So we have a community in the life science area, area which is UKM, and all the users have to sign in this community. So in this way, we can verify that the user um, is a real user that comes from a, um, a, an institution that is recognized. Because in, in, in some cases, we will need to have the approval of the institution. So, I mean, you have to uh, put all the information and register. Okay, so since this goes to a mailing and all the rest, let's continue with, um, with an account that already has permissions, right? So it's already... Um, registered. So this is my account and my account is already uh, registered. So I will go here and directly uh, connect to the system, right? So I am ready login. Uh, so the first thing that you realize is that you now have more uh, tools available there. And you, the, the first point is the federated query because you have seen that there's one data set, colon cancer, that has more than 670 cases, but you don't know exactly how many of them correspond to female and how many of them correspond to the uh, specific range area that you are interested for your study. So for this, we have a tool that is called Federated Query. If you go to the Federated Query, the first thing that if you go to search, then it will show you all the data from our providers. At this moment, we have two providers in the Federated Query. The rest will come shortly. We are now in the process of the integration of all of them, since we have to adapt part of the metadata of the different providers to the, um, the global uh, common data model and the hyperontology. So you can see that there's the this case that was the one, 679 cases. And then you say, OK, but I, I need to know how many are female and how many are in the range of age from 40 to 70, and then you click on search. Uh, maybe this is a little small. Let me uh, enlarge a bit the screen. Oh, sorry, it was too small. And then you realize that this champions in case go down, sorry, colon camp champions in case go down to 125. So from the 679 cases, 125 fulfill your inclusion criteria, females on this range area. So then you can say, okay, it fulfills my requirements. So I am interested on accessing this uh, data set. So I click on it. I go back to the to this uh, page that we have the, the information about the, the colon cancer uh, system. And then we add this data set to the request, right? So the process. Everything will be clearly this described through documents, but is adding this data set to my, um, I will say, area or my request area, and then uh, click on the selection 
to see the data that I have collected, right? So I, I'm interested in this data set, Colon Kangsten Championship phase version four, and I will send to the negotiator. So then the next application enters into uh, in, in a scene, which is the negotiator. As you have seen before, um, you have to fulfill several, uh, you have to fill in several information in order to have an application for uh, access to uh, a, a data set. So you have to have a purpose, a project, you have to have an uh, approval of an ethical committee. You have to define who will be the people that will have access to the, to the data and some other details, because this is, um, I mean, done on an um, evaluation basis. So I'll go to next and I will start completing the information. So I put the title of my study. Sorry. I write a cover letter. I mean, the explanation is a performance. Let me, maybe if I can go, uh, sorry, for to the dashboard, you can see exact information. Right? So in this guideline, you can see all the details and more explanation on that. So I go back here. I write my cover letter. I upload the list and uh, short CVs of my work team. I write my hypothesis, my objectives, my material. No, sorry. Well, that's the expected resource. My funding, my source of funding, because it's also important to understand if there's a funding underneath this this um, request and which is exactly the source to, to avoid, I mean, to understand exactly uh, if it has been already peer reviewed or if it has some, leg, um, I mean, industry implications that has to be considered. And then the supporting documentation that will include any information about the project and if the ethical committee and explain documentation, right? So then you go to next and then you can check and submit your request. If you submit your request, then it enters in the process of being evaluated, right? So now this request is under review. It will go first to a step of administrative checking that will check that all the information is valid. Then we'll go to the access committee that will request and technical evaluation and then uh, the scientific evaluation. So let's assume that we have already um, request access to this, sorry, we have granted access to this um, data set. So I already in my user have access to this data set and come back to the colon cancer app in which I have the information about the data set that I requested. Now I will go to the, to this, um, um, link and then this link drives or connects to the provider that actually has the data. So in this case, it's not data that we store in our central, in our reference uh, the repository, but data that is stored in a pro in a, the repository of a project. I enter with my life science array, but I can yeah, I can do it with my life science array at this moment. So everything is uh, use, uses the same kind of authentication. So in this way, with one single registration, you can act, have access to other. And then we enter in the tab that describes in detail this uh, data set. So I have the additional information, but I, by now I have access to the studies, right? So I assume that in this team that is working, understanding, or that is working on this project that has been requested, on colon cancer, there's a radiologist and there, there are data scientists. So in Chain Million, there are two scenarios, two types of users, data scientists and radiologists, and we have different applications. So it's important to outline by, because one of the reference uh, storage centers will use a technology evolving from this Chain Million. So you will find something very similar if you de decide to deposit your data in our central storages. So for example, let me go to this um, I click on a second window to facilitate the navigation. But yeah. So, and in this case, we are opening a viewer that will open up this study so I can browse and go through it, right? It was a colon cancer study, so it's coming up. 
uh, is loading this first. I can yeah click, for example, on this uh, third series just to open a different series and show it on the on the screen. So this will be the interface for the radiologist to check the data that is there and to keep some samples and understand how the data is prepared, what are the different series and how to get there. But let's go to the second scenario. So we have a data scientist, uh, let me move the screen, a data scientist that want to access the data in a more programmatic way, in a more direct way, right? So we have a virtual research environment in which you can process in situ the data. So it's important to say that the, in the license of the data that is there that I didn't uh, so the only way to access the data is through in situ processing. So we cannot download the data, but we can see the data and we can process the data in situ. So we can create a virtual research environment that mounts this data set and enables the researcher to perform uh, different activities, different types of, uh, of processing there. So uh, this uh, platform gives you a set of different tools to process this data. So, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, one second to enter in the system. Yeah, I have a, a little problem of, of connectivity, but yeah, one sec. Yeah, now it's coming. So I will select this one because it's an environment that is well known, is TensorFlow for AI. So again, I'm with the hat of the uh, data scientist, and I want to deploy an environment in which I can access the data. So I will call this environment, you came, webinar, and then deploy it, right? So this environment in one of the providers creates a virtual research environment for you to access the data and process. Again, insisting this is not targeted for radiologists, it is intended for data scientists that need direct access to the files and direct access to an environment with GPUs that can process the data and create their models. As I told you, it cannot be, data cannot be downloaded, so everything is accessed to a reverse proxy. So basically you have your virtual research environment here through a reverse proxy from Chimilion. From now on, it's like if you were working on your own computer. So yeah, you can click on the folder, you can view in a better way because this is easier. I can maximize it. And in the data sets, I have the data sets for which I have request access. The, da the data set, the different um, set of uh, users, uh, sorry, no, subjects. And each, each subject, I have the studies. And each, in each study, I have the series. And in the series, you will be able to see the different DCM uh, files that are uh, available uh, there, right? So these are one series. Let me click on this one. And you will see the di DICOM files that are available there. So only this data set is mounted so you can write uh, work easily. So just for illustration and very simple, I can show you that, that th there is an environment you can use GPUs uh, using this uh, Jupyter Notebooks uh, uh, format in which you can mount the data too. So I have one very simple example that it will take just one half a minute and it can be seen that it runs uh, there, right? So this is just uh, an environment in which shows uh, how to access the data, display the data, and make a remote processing. I can run the four uh, the five cases, and you will see that this is the data. Uh, this is uh, a display of the data, and these are the die contacts. And you can do you can train models on this environment. So up to here, it was the demonstration of how to. I mean, the whole process of data browsing, data access re request, and data access through one of the providers. I will pass the floor now and stop sharing, pass the floor to my colleague Esther, that will show another uh, uh, example of accessing data through a different provider. Yes, thank you. I will share my screen.
I think you can, you're able to see my screen now. That's, that's great. Yes. Uh, so yes, I will show uh, another uh, example of a data set from another provider, namely the Yokan Image project. Uh, so one of the five projects, other five uh, projects that uh, was mentioned before and exposes data uh, through the UK uh, catalog as well. And also uh, another implementation of the, the reference uh, the reference storage. So uh, to them to show you um, um, here, I go to the Eocon image, uh, the cancer image uh, .eu website, and then go to the dashboards. And in the dashboard, uh, I am going to explore uh, the public catalog. So you should realize we are back to the how uh, Ignacio started the demo as well, not being logged in. Uh, so I'm not logged in, and I'm now going to um, uh, to to find a specific to demonstrate a specific data set. So I'm interested in data from the uh, you can image provider, and I. I, I'm not going to search because I know exactly already what I want, which is a breast cancer M, uh, MRI data set, uh, which is this one. So you can see it has uh, breast MRI images, uh, MRI scans of 44 subjects. I'll go and show you a bit more details. Um, so these are, these are the descriptives of the data set. And from this point onwards, I should uh, follow the exact same procedure to get access as Ignacio already demonstrated uh, before. I'm not going to show in detail again, but I can add this uh, to my catalog and then uh, go into the negotiator process to, uh, to, ac to request access. And then once I have that, I can follow this link to find the data, which in this case is in uh, in XNOT, so the XNOT hosted by uh, Eurobio Imaging Health Arrive, uh, the central platform, and you can see the data is is only available, so the data uh, provider or the, the UK access committee should give you access before you can access the data. So I do have an account, so I will log in with my uh, personal account, which has been granted access. And then I will follow the link again to end up in the project immediately, um, where you can see this is uh, the you can image data set with the 44 subjects. Uh, so this is a list of all 44 participants in the project for, for whom uh, scans are available. And I can click uh, any of those uh, participants and see that this person has one MRI session scanned in 2021. And this provides access to the functionality of XNOT. So I can use the viewer here, few images to, uh, to, um, to, sh to show the images. So it uses the XNOT OHIF viewer, uh, which all its functionality. And here you see all the, the many image series uh, available for this, for this participant. So I can show you one example and scroll through or another one. Um, so this is uh, and this uh, this platform. So I can go back here. Does allow for downloading. So it of course depends on what are the requirements for a specific data set, whether you could, whether you are allowed to download the data uh, to your own system or only to a secure processing environment. So that will be data sets uh, dependent. Uh, but it uh, so in principle the platform allows for downloading. Uh, and it allows for access management, so coupled to the Life Science AI, uh, the, the access committee can set exactly who will get access to, to the data and in what form. And the data can be downloaded via this web functionality, but also using um, uh, the, the, the REST interface or using the XNOT by package that we have available to also uh, in command line code or in scripts work with the data from XNOT. And with that, I give the word back to uh, Ignacio. Thank you very much, Esther. So before having the questions and answer, uh, we would like to have um, some information about uh, your thoughts through a slide, all right? So let me share again my screen, now the, the window. Um, 
And we have prepared a couple of slides uh, showing several questions. So this is the first one. So one second, yeah. You can go to slido.com and enter this number. And with this number, you will be able to join our um, a poll. There is only three questions now, three questions uh, after the discussion on this, and then we we will go on, right? So this is the number, slido. 3.205, And then we can go to the first question, right? So you have the number here. So what role do you fit best in? So we want to understand from our, our audience here, which is the, the role in which you feel uh, more uh, re represented. So please answer really this information. So we'll wait until a good amount of numbers. Okay. Okay, from the this first, this sixty, um around sixty, um, you know, it's getting quite even. But it's true, it's clear that we have a, a, a two prominent profiles, which are the data requester and the member that will be a partner there. So it's important that, that you go to the member page in which you can find or the sorry, better the cancer image.eu, which is more updated there, that information about how to become a, a member through the open calls that we will have. Okay, that's that's good. Uh, I see the more answers coming, but uh, I think that the tendency is clear, so we can go to the to the next questions. So this is a little more complex to to fill in. Let me explain. So the question is: If you are a you were a data holder, which scenario would best would best would best fit you? So we want you to rank the first three cases. But we assume that may there may be that one of these options is not uh, good for you, so you can link blank. So feder federated the local storage with research data. So you have a local storage on your site, transferring the identified data to the central storage, and federated the local storage that has processing capabilities, right? So this is the case of hospital or re repositories. They have the processing capabilities for distributed uh, computing or federated learning. Okay, so it seems that the federated option is, is preferred. Yeah, the two, there are two options. Yeah, so clearly, um, yeah, the three are quite even, but it seems that the federating case is, is a little prominent if you sum the two of them, so with 45, 44 answers. Okay, so let me go to the third and last question of this part, which is very similar, but thinking on the data user. So if you were a data user, we want you to rank the first three cases that you feel better, right? That I mean, which is downloading the data and processing on my own, accessing the central service and process data in situ or use a federated uh, environment. So I can assume that some any of this option is not acceptable to you. So you can, uh, instead of selecting it, select a black option. In this case, we ensure that everybody has selected three options and that. Right. Yeah, yeah, we understand that downloading data is the preferred case. Uh, the the inconvenient there is that uh, some uh, providers will not accept in their access conditions to download data because uh, traceability is is uh, lost. But this is important for us to ensure that we contemplate this possibility in our platform, and we also work on data licenses that will support this case. Right. So I wait a bit. Okay. So I think that the answers are quite clear. 
there. Okay, so this was our first slide in which I'm trying to understand uh, your, uh, I mean, your profile or your uh, view. And then I will open a second short slide, which is, uh, let me go back to this poll, which is more uh, open. This is another number, apologies for that. It is more open. And this uh, slide tries to uh, gather your impressions, but uh, in more free uh, manner, right? So without. First one is please outline the features that you like best from our platform. Free text, please be short because this uh, will facilitate uh, understanding. Really appreciate your feedback, right? That will be very valuable. The data users, variety of data sources, data catalog, access to diverse, big data. Okay, findability. There's a lot of points in the catalog. Okay, the federated data processing is also good. The compliance with the regulation, with good point. Right, right. So I see. Okay. Good. Okay. Very good. Very, very good point. So clearly the all the the points related to the data access uh, are preferred, also the access to the data. There's a lot of uh, comments on the federated data. So I think that's very, very good. I'll wait for the, the participant to continue to end typing. And we will go through all these comments and I will try to analyze and have a a summary on our uh, yeah, impression. Thank you very much for your feedback. That's very useful. So let's go to the second, uh, obviously. What are the features that you dislike or you like less? Some of the cases are, I mean, bounded by the requirements of our data sources. And some of them are clearly uh, things that can be improved. So this will also help us very much on defining the, the new requirements for the next iterations. We are planning to have iterations every, every six months. Yeah. OK. OK. OK, clearly there is a lot of uh, concerns about the access uh, procedure, right? Logins were confusing. Yeah, I understand that uh, first time at least is, it takes some time to understand the idea. So there was a technical decision, but it's something that we can reconsider. Yeah, the restricted access is another thing. I mean, I know that the uh, free access to, to data, yeah, that's something that we, we will work. It will depend. Um, on many cases, but uh, basically the work working on simplified access methods is something that we take note and we will um, we will um, pass this also to our uh, legal team in, in the projects. Yeah. So I see clearly that the access is one of the points that is getting more concerns. Okay. Sorry for not going one by one, but I I, I really uh, I mean I'm sure that all the points will be considered and we will write a, a response note uh, along with the with the with the webinar. So that, thank you very much. It was very uh, sorry. There's one participant more. We have 33, 34 comments. That will be just.
Okay, I don't want to leave anyone. Okay, so thank you. Let me go to the last question. Um, so after the webinar, would you consider applying as a data requester, as a data provider, as a tool provider, as a future stakeholder, or not taking the decision? Okay, so most of our attendees are data requesters, as can be expected. It's very nice to see a large amount of responders that are also considering applying as a data provider. That's a very encouraging uh, answer. So we will work. I mean, this will also help us shaping our, uh, I mean, work plan. Okay, very good. Thank you very much for the feedback. Very valuable. And uh, as, as promised, we will prepare uh, a summary of all the answers. So I think I can stop sharing and uh, back to you, Peter, for moderating the question and answers. And Yes, thank you so much. Um, I think some of the questions uh, we, we were able to answer, but maybe we can go through the ones from the chat first since it's a bit harder to track those. Um, so there was one question asking about the uh, data governance tool that we use, if that's a, a, a single tool that we can uh, point out or not. Yeah, for the data governance, if if you refer to the, um, I mean, we have traceability uh, traceability uh, tools embedded in the platform in the way that every action is registered. So, in I can talk at the technical level. There is a whole team working on the legal basis for the data governance, uh, but at the technical level, we provide tools for ensuring that all the users are well identified, all the licenses of the data sets are well described that the access committee will consider the, 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 the access request versus the data licenses and that the actions of the user will be registered. So there's always a possibility to understand for the data holder what was the use of the data. There are other legal implications that I cannot answer directly. Yes, um, that does lead to another question that has been uh, raised, I think, two or three times. Um, who is part of the negotiating team that decides to permit uh, or, or yeah permit or, or yeah access to um to the different data sets yes uh, i will take the first uh, uh, global um, uh, i mean answer and then i will i can let also luis to answer and correct my my point so there's there are three bodies that we define there's an access committee which is the one that um, manages the request. And this access committee is supported by a technical team that analyzes from the technical point of view the request, because some of the requests may not be technical sound, and we can send a request back to uh, of clarification. And there's this an ethical surveillance body, not an ethical committee. So what it does is check that the ethical approval is valid with respect to the purpose. The access committee uh, involves people from the from the project, and in the cases of data sets that are um, external, I mean, depending on the conditions of accessing, it will involve uh, also people from the provider side. Did I say it correctly, Luis? Uh, no, perfect. Just to share with everybody, I mean, the willingness is not only to is not to limit access to data. I mean, data will be be open to researchers. It's just to check that the research or the innovators or the companies or the institutions asking for data, they do have behind the right reasons with the ethical approvals and technical considerations. So it's to facilitate the process. Yes, thank you. We, we also have a couple of questions uh, regarding the amount of detail for for the different data cases. So for instance, um, how much detail is there available? Do, do we have additional reports or pathology data 
um, or, or things like that that support just the imaging data? Well, it, it will depend. Uh, I mean, at this moment, we are relying on data that comes from this age for hi project. So this data is limited to imaging data and clinical associated information. In some cases, we have clinical information that include, includes some genetic uh, biomarkers and, and the rest. Uh, we, in our project, we are we have the commitment also of linking to BMRI. So it has, uh, which has been also a, good, a very interest, very important provider of tools for this uh, component that will also contribute with additional types of data. So we are open, but in this first step, we uh, limit our, ourselves to imaging data. Yes, thank you. Um, then we do have a couple of questions, uh, or maybe maybe let me uh, mention this first. If we do not have time to get to all of the questions uh, during this webinar, we of course have a list of the questions. We will make sure that there are answers to all the questions uh, published as soon as the recording goes uh, online as well. Um, so if your question doesn't get answered during the, the live session today, uh, we will do our best to get back to you uh, and, and publish an answer to your question uh, in the next couple of days. Um, another question uh, or, or a couple of questions that we've had is um, what the, or are there any, or will there be any fees for users um, to look for the data, process the data, access the data and so on? Yes, this, it, this will depend on the, on the conditions of the data set. So we are open to support any type of, of, of consideration. So in a situation in which the user uh, does not request, uh, I mean, it will depend also on, on, the, on, the, on the request, right? So uh, we are not foreseeing to have, we have, we, as Luis say, we want to facilitate the access to the data, but it may happen, for example, that the user want to train a model and request a lot of processing capa capacity. And then if, the user want to do it in a, uh, I mean, in the reasonable point of time, we can ensure that they have resources, but they will have some kind of fee. But in principle, we are only considering fees in the cases that there's a very special requirement from the access, in my understanding. Uh, yes, uh, just to uh, clarify that, which uh, Nacho was saying, our willingness is not to have, let's say, fee for data, is a uh, pay for service. I mean, we will have to do things to prepare the data, to check, curate, validate. And our understanding is that not now that we are on the construction phase and it will be much easier because it's funded by the European Commission and the partners themselves. But once the project is, uh, and the, the project is finalized and the infrastructure is running, there will be running costs and, and pays for services, not meaning those um, people that will take care that the quality, normalization, standards, appropriateness of the data is fulfilled. So we do foresee that part. Uh, maybe in, in between, a very practical question. There was um, also a question regarding the viewer that was shown for the uh, chameleon data. Uh, which one was that, and is that available freely? No, it is not available freely. It's embedded in our platform, and it's a um, it's Kivin Precision. It's from one of our partners in the consortium. Um, yeah, it it is, and, and we have a license that is embedded within the platform, but it's not freely available. But yeah, we can consider. I mean. Uh, it, it, depending on the notes, there will be notes that could add any other uh, viewer there. But in the official system, we rely on giving petition because it's a partner of our consortium and we have a very clear communication and the capability of have modifications on the viewer. The other one that I showed, uh, the OHIF viewer is uh, open source. It's part of XNAT and is available freely. Exactly. Thank you. Um, there's also another practical question, uh, which ontologies are being used for the annotations? Yes, um, the project is developing a hyper ontology that will facilitate, and a common data, uh, data model that will facilitate integration with different providers. There's a full report that has been published recently, a deliverable, that you can 
find, I think, on the website or not, you can contact us and we will send the information. And if I'm correct, it's DICOMSEC for annotations. Okay, good, thanks. Yes, we, we also have a couple of questions regarding the data sets. And I, I, I think this is um, sort of up to the data provider, I suppose. Um, for instance, if we have additional uh, information, we can display, uh, th for instance, uh, average age or low and high range, uh, or uh, more specifically, if, if, for instance, a data set contains CT scans, uh, if both native and contrast enhanced images are being shown, um, or you know how much clinical data is available. I, I believe this is very much up to the provider as well, right? Exactly. So since, I mean, we um, are eager to support data coming from projects, I mean, that they want to have a persistence of their data, for example, or other providers. I mean, we have a variety of, 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 of data um, amount. Uh, but I would say that all the data is well described. And yeah, before you access to the or request an access, you will be able to have additional information that will be published in these data along with the data sets. Or you can get into contact with the provider and, and ask for the specific questions. Yes. We also received a question uh, regarding uh, storage for, for um researchers doing analysis uh, or, or, or processing. Um, practically speaking, how much storage would be offered or how many concurrent users does the platform support? Uh, and, and maybe some questions like this. Okay, that's that's a very good question. So um, at this moment, I mean, we are relying on these providers, remote providers. We are in the process of, uh, of finalizing the central storage. The central storage, I mean, there's two central storage. Central is, uh, is not a good word, reference storage. We have one reference storage at Erasmus in uh, the Netherlands, and we have another one in Valencia and the UPV. So uh, the one that is being built now at the UPV will have uh, uh, 1,000 cores, uh, up to uh, 40 GPUs and, 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 and important processing capability. Um, I don't have the numbers for the storage uh, at this moment in my head, but we have tested recently uh, the same technology uh, in the frame of uh, Chai Million with in an open challenge. And we had 25 concurrent users training models and doing inference in the platform uh, for uh, four data sets that in total involve um, around uh, 2000 uh, studies. So yeah, so uh, considering that the reference node that we will put will be four times bigger, we assume that we can uh, deal with a with an, a continuous demand up to 75, 100 concurrent users. Okay, thank you. Um, I also see we have a couple of questions related to um, imaging itself. So for instance, we have one question about um, MRI sequences and if there's, for instance, uh, a preference for research sequences or more standard clinical sequences and then um, the same uh, was extended to CT, whether we have, need to have, you know, uh, standard or, or more scientific um, imaging sequences there. I think this is also pretty much up to the data provider, right? What they would like to share. <laughs> also, also on, on the different repositories we are linking and where data come from. So we do, it's not that we do foresee. I mean, we will have data coming from clinical trials, so in those cases, um, images will be, let's say, uh, extremely heavy protocolized uh, to the trial, but most of the links will be related to real-world data, data coming from hospitals on a standard acquisition uh, protocols, so we do expect an uh, extremely large amount of variability and that's why we did introduce in our platform quality controls um, and quality checks um, that uh, researchers will be exposed to a extremely high variability on, on data, um, vendors, protocols, techniques, and um, let's say in some way resolutions. Yes, thank you. Um... 
I think we're we're almost uh, at the end of our allotted time. So maybe we have time for two more questions and then I have uh, a little bit more information about the open call, which I think some questions would then also be answered by this. Um, so one further question we have is, how do we make sure that data provided is in adequate quality? Well, that's a very good question. Absolutely. So this is something that worries, uh, uh, I mean, concern us a lot. So first we have, we, we define a two-stage model in which first we provide with tools and some guidelines to the provider to check if the data fulfills some quality criteria, especially for the part of the of the imaging, especially for the anonymization, which is also a, a, a quality criteria. And then once that the request is, is done, we have a check also of the of some samples to understand that if the data is uh, I mean, aligned with respect to it was stated in the in the request, right? So, additionally, we will also would like to involve the community, right? So, um, involving the community to mark to to score or to rank the data sets will help us a lot understanding which data sets are more popular because they are more productive, right? So, and that will be a tool that we will implement so we can have the feedback of the community uh, helping us to understand to identify data set that could have some bias or some detail that has become uh, un undetected. Yes, and I, I think I kept one of the hardest questions for the end. Um, what incentives are there for data providers? Luis, do you want to take this question about the incentives for the data providers? No. Are you on mute? Sorry, uh, no, sorry, we hear you, sorry, sorry. Well, uh, incentives are, we really don't want to split incentives into researchers, data providers, but just thinking on, on those that will provide data, and I also understand its knowledge, they will be able to not only participate in the infrastructure, also be partners on calls and proposals and, and open to the research community. So I do foresee that they will be in some way part of research calls and therefore that will be the main benefit. Plus being part of open science and, and, and this infrastructure community. All right, thank you very much. Um, since I, I still have two or three more slides to show uh, and we are almost out of time, um, I want to thank everyone for for all the questions. Um, we unfortunately didn't get to all of the questions, but like I said, we will do our best to answer them in writing uh, and publish that on the website cancerimage.eu uh, in the next days. Um, before we leave, though, um, I do want to share uh, that we have uh, an open call coming up because there were some questions actually uh, regarding um, support uh, for for uh, people who are, are interested in providing data or providing AI tools. And uh, this this might be a perfect opportunity for this if you're uh, already very interested in it. So we have a, a, an open call for new collaborators uh, launching in April, so next month. Um, and uh, as the slide says, this is uh, this is a good opportunity for data holders, but also for AI developers or AI tool providers to uh, to contribute. Um, and um, this this is really for for data holders that can supply data, uh, but also for data users that want to develop or train or benchmark uh, or validate AI algorithms uh, using the the data that we have and the platform that we demonstrated earlier today. Um, so this basically extends to to anyone who fits the data holder or data user thing, and 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 it includes, uh, for instance, academic centers. It includes hospitals, but it also includes industry, um, both large and small. Um, we do have some funding available for this, uh, which can go up to two hundred and fourteen thousand euro per uh, applicant. However, please note that this is fifty percent funded. Um, we we have to follow the the funding rules and eligibility criteria that um, the UK project falls under, uh, which means that there is a fifty percent funding rate. Um, so effectively, then uh, a successful applicant would receive fifty percent of these two hundred forty thousand euro, uh, and the other uh, portion would need to be covered uh, through other grants, through other funds, or other means uh, that the applicant can um, provide. Uh, I'm I'm happy to report that we 
uh, we more or less finalized the call text and we uh, we will be able to share that shortly on cancerimage.eu. Uh, so please do keep an eye out on the on the website for more information on that. Uh, we, of course, will try to make some noise on social media and, and through other uh, partners and websites and so on uh, to make sure that everyone can uh, can see this. Um, for for those who indicated that they would like to stay up to date uh, or or also receive information on the open call during the sign up for this webinar, you will of course also get a dedicated email about this uh, when we go live. Um, with that, I think uh, we can we can just very briefly show uh, our overall timeline and what we uh, what we intend to do. Um, I also want to thank all of the uh, all of the speakers or all of our panelists, uh, Luis, uh, Ignacio, Esther, Alexandra, and and Karina for uh, pre presenting this overview and and guiding us through the technical demonstration. Um, I think our next major milestone, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ignacio, will be in June this year. Um, so so then we will hopefully introduce some some further capabilities um, and some further things that are being connected to, to each other. Um, so please come back uh, at that time at the very latest uh, to to play around with the system and see uh, how it can work for you. And uh, if you have any questions, please just reach out to us. We're, of course, always there to answer as much as we can. And I think with that, I can stop sharing my screen. We're one minute over our time, but maybe I can pass back the word for a last message to uh, Alexandra and Luis to uh, to close off for today. So maybe I start. Uh, thank you very much for this for this for this webinar and um, to all the presenters. And it's amazing the work you are doing. So I I I I am very impressed. And I was I also thank the participants for the questions, uh, and also for the answers. So um, I think they are all very val valid. And this is exactly what we wanted to get from this webinar to further guide the project and make sure that it makes your needs. So thanks a lot for that. Um, well, just a minor uh, word. Thanks, everybody. And keep engaged with Eukain. This is our opportunity to really foster medical imaging, precision medicine, and AI. The infrastructure is uh, quite important now and close to be running, and the open call is there, and we are really willing to uh, to try to do our best. I was also willing to thank Adir for their uh, coordination. Thanks, Peter, for organizing uh, this webinar. And of course, Esta, uh, Nacho, Karina, all those of you that were pivotal in the success of the uh, deployment of the infrastructure. And we'll keep in touch. All right. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we'll, uh, we'll we can close the session. Like I said, we will make sure that the recording will be made available in the next days, uh, as well as the answers to any remaining questions. Thank you so much, and uh, have a nice day.